I'm in Indonesia to more fully understand the deforestation that's going on here. It's an urgent issue because destroying forests emits about the same amount of greenhouse gases as the world's entire transportation sector. And I'm learning that deforestation has other victims. Once you've seen them sitting behind bars like this, it sort of brings the reality home. I hear you, man. <laughs> Lona Drosher Nielsen founded this refuge 15 years ago. Since then, more than a thousand orangutans have come here because the forests where they lived were burned to the ground to make room for palm oil and other industries. She has a two-year-old baby. Oh, you see the baby is with her? Oh, look at that baby. Wow. Now they have nowhere else to go. The very small babies, they actually used to stay in my house. I had up to like 36 babies um, in my house, yes. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Milani. Milani. Hey, Milani. Hi. You want my hat? Oh. That's an orangutan greeting. Just oh. taking your hand and sniff it. You look in those eyes, it's like they take you somewhere. I think she might have fallen in love. <laughs> Every single orangutan that has come into the center, the mothers has been killed. Who killed the mothers? The palm oil industry used to pay. We don't have any proof that they're still doing this, but when they, they started opening up back in 2002, three, four, they were paying awards to the local people for killing orangutans. You know, you can't just turn them away and throw them out, can you? First we took the home away, and then they killed the mothers. And are we then got just gonna say, no, they're not worth it? This is the forest fires. During June, uh, there were almost 10,000 hotspots in only one month. I'm seeing the extent of the destruction at a 200,000-acre national park called Teso Nilo. It's supposed to be protected, but that hasn't stopped palm oil interests from invading the park, torching it, and setting up their plantations in the ashes. And apparently, there's big money behind it. To establish an oil palm plantation, we calculate that you need $5 million to do so. Wow. Right. Well, you don't invest five million dollars in something unless it's a lead pipe cinch that it's gonna mm -hmm. that it, that you're gonna get away with it. So you, there must be some protection at a higher level. Yeah. Some strong politicians in this province or in the district as well mm -hmm. are behind this. So they're pretty confident that there's not going to be any enforcement or any kind of punishment for what they've done. Oh man. Two members of local parliaments are being investigated for ownership of plantations inside the park. And it's bigger than that. A company called Wilmar, which trades almost half the world's palm oil, has a mill near the park and had been buying from the illegal plantations. Wilmar supplies everyone from Nabisco to Gillette. So there's even a chance that some Tessanilo palm oil has made its way to your local supermarket.
been two years since the president here declared a moratorium on deforestation, and it's obviously being ignored. Driving through one patch of burned out forest after another, I'm more and more outraged. These trees used to store vast amounts of carbon, but now all that carbon is in the atmosphere, warming the planet even more. Back at Tessa Nilo National Park, I'm joined by Kunturo Manku Subroto, Indonesia's top official in charge of combating deforestation and corruption. This is a national park. This is a, supposed to be a, controlled by the government, right? Well, how, how does that make you feel? I mean... Very sad. Watching this happening here in front of our eyes, makes very sad. Contoro wishes he could do more to stop what's happening, but despite his impressive title, he doesn't have the power to enforce the law. We're told that there are hundreds of, of illegal operations. Why isn't it being stopped? Corruption is the real enemy of, the, of, of a good system. You issue an illegal license, you permit them to operate like that, you don't have any environmental Wait, analysis. You just said something that I didn't understand. You said you issue them an illegal license. They can give a, a license to somebody in violation of the rules? Some of them have license, some of them they don't have license. Right. Those who have license, sometimes their license is overlapped with another license. So that's illegal. But the Minister of Forestry was here. He came in a <laughs> helicopter and he met people and he saw what was happening here. Didn't he have the power or the authority to well, stop what was happening? He has the power to stop it. He does the power to stop it. Well, he didn't. But he didn't. it's just a matter of how do you exercise that power. This palm oil plantation is owned by Frankie Wijaya, one of Indonesia's richest men. How many acres do you have here? In this area, we have about 50,000 hectares. He's the king of palm oil in a land where palm oil is king. Indonesia exports more of the stuff than any other country on the planet. But you have other plantations around the country? Yes, totally. We have about 450,000 hectares. Wow, it's huge. Very big, yes. That's well over a million acres. What used to be here before it was palm oil? Long, long time ago, suddenly it's just always for us. Maybe not that long ago. In the 1960s, forests covered more than 80% of the country. Now, almost half of that is gone. For years, the government encouraged deforestation by taking land from indigenous people and licensing it to companies like Sinar Mas, the conglomerate owned by the Wajayas. They made billions in the process. But in the last few years, Frankie Wajaya has turned over a new leaf. He's pledged to stop destroying forests. Environmental sustainability and economic opportunity is something that can be coexist together. And that's why he's agreed to show me his operation. How many times does a tree get harvested? Three times in Three a month. Three times in a month? In a month. Wow. A lot of manual work. Yeah. This bunch is about 20, 22 kilos. Right. And then there's a lot of fruitlets. So these the, are the things that need to be picked up. That's the profit. That's the profit. Palm oil has made a huge contribution to the economy of Indonesia. But there's also a flip side, right? Yes. 
there's been a lot of environmental destruction, and particularly deforestation, which has contributed to greenhouse gas emissions. And some of the wealthiest people in this country were responsible for the most damage. I may want to disagree for that, because for those big industry or big corporation, certainly they want to be sustainable. They now they do. Be. Now they do. Yes. Did they in the past? Wasn't there an endless supply of forests in their minds or in the minds of the government, and that the, that it was important to get as much income out of that area? And didn't the, the forest suffer? And didn't your family get enriched? And other rich people in this country, hardworking people, but rich people. Do you ever feel guilty about that? At that time, the government said, "This is okay. You can do this." I know that. So, I'm asking you now, even before the government. Uh, announced for non-burning. We already announced ourselves two, three years earlier. So, Frankie, no you're use. you're an enlightened man. Yes. You know the science. You know business. You have a sense of social responsibility. But still, I'm asking the question: Do you feel guilty at all? If you know and you do it, then you feel guilty. If you do not know and you do it, and you correct it when you know it, then you don't have to feel guilty. But Frankie didn't just change out of the goodness of his heart. That's only part of the story. He cleaned up his act after Greenpeace targeted him and his company, Sinar Mas, and got some of the world's biggest corporations to stop buying from him. Bustar, Harrison, how are you? I'm good, man. Bustar Maitar led this Greenpeace campaign and many others, and made a lot of enemies along the way. You've had threats against your own personal safety, haven't you? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Do yes. you take that seriously? Uh, I take seriously, but I'm not take that personally. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because if, if I take that personally, it's become personal to personal. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You recently entered into an agreement with perhaps the largest family-owned conglomerate here, who are the major producers of palm oil, the Wajaya family. Sinarmas. Sinarmas. You were instrumental in persuading them to make changes in their policy, yeah. right? Yeah. After almost three and a half years campaign, blocking the tanker of the palm oil in the biggest palm oil port in Indonesia, we get the attention from them. So you directly with Frankie Wijaya. Yeah, right? I meet with uh, Frankie Wijaya a couple of times. As a human being, yeah. I think he have heart also to, yeah. to to protecting our forest. Of course, also as a, he's the businessman, he's talking a lot about the the employment, the economic growth, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. But in the end, government is the one who should managing this. Do you think that the Minister of Forestry is really committed to the policy of deforestation. I can see his heart. I, I talk to him quite a lot. Right. But in Indonesia, also, is a lot of politics going right. on. Right. Corruption, lack of the governance. So in terms of talking, he is saying a lot of things good, but in terms of action, it's far away. It seems like the government itself is a big part of the problem. I have a meeting with the forestry minister. I have a lot of questions. Finally, I'm meeting the forestry minister. I have a lot of questions. What's blocking the effort to save that peat forest? The lease of the land from the okay. government. It's not being granted. Why? The Minister of Forestry have to sign this concession right. Why is Tessa Nilo almost gone? What about the corruption, the devastation, the complete lack of enforcement? Minister, thank you for taking the time with us. We've been traveling around your country for the past couple of weeks we have some questions in the last 15 years 80 percent of the forest has been commercially exploited and when you ask many indonesians why this has taken place 
They say, sir, that there's too strong a connection between business and politics in this country. Uh, yang lain, uh, Anda tahu kita baru berdemokrasi. Uh, tapi saya yakin kita dalam waktu yang panjang mungkin akan 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 apa namanya terjadi titik yang seimbang. One project to preserve a, a peatland forest has been seeking approval for many years. The last step in the process is your signature, sir. Will you sign the paper that will allow them to preserve this critical natural resource? Saya kalau tidak salah baru separuh yang disetujui kira-kira seratus ribu hektar. You are willing to sign yeah. the paper yeah. to give them fifty percent of yeah. what they're asking for. When will that happen? Kalau mereka setuju saya kira har lusa minggu depan sudah bisa. We were in Tessanilo. Tessanilo. Mm. <laughs> National Park. Okay. It's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. not funny. Only mm. 18% of it remains. Mm. We saw it. There are new roads, new illegal roads. Forests cut, trees laying on the ground, burnt where they fell. It's devastating. It's heartbreaking to see it. You saw it. You pledged a resolution. What have you done? Saya baru lihat terkait kaget. Kami tiap hari untuk mencoba menyelesaikan persoalan. Kami baru mengalami apa yang disebut demokrasi. Sir, they didn't Kamu drop ke... out of the sky on this property. They came there over a period of time, and there was plenty of time to stop the behavior, stop the activity. Tadi saya sudah jelaskan. Ini bukan Amerika, memang berbeda. Kami baru mengalami apa yang disebut dengan reformasi. Ya, baru ini, sekarang orang baru bebas. Baru bebas kadang-kadang kami memang surplus, apa yang disebut dengan surplus demokrasi. Oleh karena itu kami sekarang buat program untuk mencoba so memindahkan mereka, yeah, okay, mencari lahan pengganti nama. I understand. Yeah. You're willing to lose the battle. Mm. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Okay, all right. I see all of this wealth, but it's at the top of the heap. Uh. Down at the bottom of the heap, sir, there's inequity. There's illegality mm -hmm. and there's corruption. Mm. Thank you for your time. Sama-sama. Terima kasih. Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. Years of living dangerously. The day after my interview, the forestry minister is telling the media, I didn't show him enough respect. <laughs> Maybe he's right. He's threatening to have me deported. It's all over the news. Today, I'm supposed to meet with the president to find out how he feels about the devastation of his country's forests. And with all the controversy, the media glare now waiting for us is intense. You've created a moratorium on exploiting natural forest. Is it being respected? Tentu ada yang menentang. Ada yang tidak suka dengan moratorium policy, tapi bagi saya harus. Karena banyak yang bisa dilakukan tanpa merusak lahan gambut. One of the unfortunate things we've seen is disregard of the law. For instance, in Tessa Nilo, only 18% sir, of the park remains. You're aware of this. Mr. President, in conversation with the uh, forestry minister yesterday, um, I asked him about the respect for the law and why it was that there was so much illegal activity. Isn't there an enforcement effort that can help at least set an example? Tentu saya tidak selalu tahu apa yang terjadi di setiap jengkal di Indonesia ini. Saya mendengarnya pun tidak happy kejadian seperti ini. Tentu bagi saya, pemerintah daerah, Kementerian Kehutanan, ya kami semua, harus menertibkan itu. Saya sudah menerima bahwa itu tidak benar dan harus kami atasi. I understand, Mr. President. All due respect. I understand. Ya, terima kasih. Tapi saya belum puas sampai pada tingkat yang Indonesia betul-betul... Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. But as I leave, I wonder if there's just too much pressure to develop the forests for anything to change. I'm 
back in California, I'm about to see where palm oil ends up after it leaves Indonesia. This factory is run by a company called Unilever, which uses more palm oil than any other manufacturer in the world. So, Gavin, I understand you're retired now, but you were the chief sustainability officer of Unilever? That's right. I mean, how much palm oil does uh, Unilever buy in a year? We buy about 1.5 million tons, which represents 3% of what's produced globally. It's used in both our food products and our home and personal care products, things like shampoos and soaps and body lotions and that kind of thing. Unilever makes dozens of all-American brands, from Dove soap to Ben & Jerry's ice cream. For years, the company was also a major accomplice to deforestation. But then it made an about-face and pledged to stop buying palm oil from companies that are actively destroying forests. When did that policy become a real active ingredient in your corporate plan? There's no doubt about it that the um, attack that Greenpeace made on us in 2008 catalyzed action inside the company. I saw these people climbing the building, and I hadn't a clue what it was. By accident, I happened to be the most senior person in the building that day. And so I had to go down and talk to the Greenpeace guys down there. It was quite a life-changing moment. We changed very fundamentally. Just a month later, the CEO at the time made this public commitment about sourcing all of the palm oil sustainably by 2015. But how can Unilever know that all its palm oil is OK? When I was in Tessanillo National Park, I learned that some of the biggest suppliers, including a giant company called Wilmar, were buying and selling from illegal plantations. We've been to Indonesia, and we've been to Tessanillo. Right now, it's being redeveloped uh, illegally, I must add, as uh, palm oil plantations. The nearest mill to Tessanillo is a Wilmar mill. Unilever buys palm oil from Wilmar. That is true. And Wilmar has refused to take the responsibility for policing its supply chain. And yet, Unilever continues to buy from Wilmar. So, in the palm oil industry, it's difficult to avoid Wilmar. They are vast, they are huge. But I think you'll find that Wilmar is a business in transition. It has a huge distance to travel, but it's really important that it reaches its destination because without Wilmar, we won't solve the deforestation issue. How can we know that, that you're sincere in your efforts and that it's not just some public relations campaign of Unilever to look good to its consumers? I don't know the answer to that question. I really don't know because this is this is tricky. We can't provide reassurance on all of these things. This is very much not just about an individual company, call it Unilever or another company. This is about trying to transform the whole market. And it's really important that we do that. Because if these forests go, then it's a sad lookout for all humanity. The lookout just got a bit brighter. After this conversation, Wilmar announced it would not buy palm oil from recently deforested land. So far, these are just words, but at least they're good words. The forestry minister also made good on his pledge to protect half of that peat forest. You are willing to sign that, yeah. the paper. Yeah. 50%. And recently, the director of Tessanillo National Park was fired. Some of the illegal plantations were raided by police and three signed an agreement to leave the park. It's not nearly enough, but it's proof that things can change. Extinction is happening and we are watching. People need to see what's gone wrong and they have to be exposed to the mechanisms that can help make it right. You've got to bring to people's hearts and minds an understanding of what's going on out there and the rate of change, or it's all gonna be gone and we'll have no place to live.
Our kids will have no place to live. 